Good morning. How are we? Good. Uh, man, we're glad that you're here with us this morning uh, again. My, um, my name's Matt. I'm the minister here at North. Uh, glad that you are joining us. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. So if you want to flip there and stick a thumb in it, that's where we're going to start here in just a second, Acts chapter 2. We are in kind of the midst of a study looking at uh, the early church and uh, the things that they did uh, and how God used them to totally change kind of the, uh, the known world at the time and make an impact on those around them. And so what we're doing is we're just kind of going through uh, some of the major things that happened in the early church, primarily in the book of Acts. Acts, but we'll, we'll be in other places as well. And then just drawing a, a kind of a line over to us and, and seeing where uh, we go from here and what we can do with this. So Acts chapter 2 um, comes right immediately following what we talked about last week. And so just as a brief recap, we dealt with chapter 1 and then the first part of chapter 2 last week. And, and so Acts starts off with uh, the, the disciples, Jesus' followers, with him. And this is kind of Jesus' last moments with with people on this earth, and he kind of commissions them, you know, you need to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, but then you need to, you need to go, and you need to impact this world uh, around you. And, and so, uh, Jesus then leaves them, goes back up into heaven, <coughs> excuse me, they uh, enter into this, this short period where they wait uh, uh, for the Holy Spirit to come, and then Acts chapter 2 uh, which is where we ended last week, uh, deals with the Holy Spirit kind of coming on them. And there's this whole scene where uh, there's this rushing wind and, and they started speaking in all these other languages because of the Holy Spirit. And it was drawing the attention of a crowd, right? And you remember they were accusing this group of people of being drunk, right? Because it was like nine in the morning. And, and, and so that's where we pick up today. Acts chapter two, we're gonna start in verse 14. And we're just gonna read uh, through almost the rest of of the chapter here, uh, that's where we're going to land today. So Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 14, this is what happens immediately, immediately following. It says, but Peter from this moment stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and proclaimed to them, men of Judah and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the, the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity, and then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days, and, and they, will, uh, they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. And the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. And then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used, excuse me, lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says of himself, I saw the Lord ever before me because he is at my right hand and I will, be, and I will not be shaken Therefore, my heart was, was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not leave me in Hades or allow your Holy One to, be, to see decay. And you have revealed the paths of life to me and you will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing this in advance, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not left in, hazy, in Hades, uh, and his flesh did not experience decay. God had resurrected, resurrected this Jesus, and we are all witnesses of this. Therefore, 
Since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, Let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when they heard this, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified strongly, urging them, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I am I'm thankful, for, um, thankful for your word. And I'm thankful for the early church and the lessons that we get to learn from them 2,000 years later uh, that can still impact our lives so greatly. And God, I, I pray as, as we work through this text that um, you would reveal the things that you want us to see, God, that you would, you would speak to us, that you would encourage us and challenge us and convict us, God. Give us the ears to hear what you want to say to us and then give us the strength and the courage to step out and to follow wherever you want to lead us, God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that uh, he went to the cross for us, took our p- place so that we can have eternity with you, God. And so we praise you. God, do with us today what you want. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Peter stands up in front of this large group of people and starts to preach this very first message of the church age, right? The very first message that, that launched the church into existence, really. And, and we have to understand kind of what Peter did intentionally here. So we're going we're gonna to kind of work our way through this text and, and pick out a few uh, notable things that Peter did intentionally. So he starts off after realizing he has this kind of, this, this new uh, power from God that he got, the Holy Spirit that had descended on them, right? They had received the Holy Spirit and, and, and obeying what Jesus said, when Jesus says, go out, like start getting to work once you get the Holy Spirit, Peter realized what's happened and he, and he looks around and he sees, we have the attention of the crowd right now. Like we, we everybody is looking at us right now. And, and so he takes the opportunity to speak to this crowd. Now understand again what's happening. If you were here last week, we kind of touched on this briefly. Understand what's happening in the city right now. Like, like it is not just local people that are here. This is a large gathering of people from many different areas of kind of the known area. They've all kind of made their way to one city in order to participate in a festival. And so what you have here is you have a large group of people that are from many different nations and many different speak, many different languages, right? And so you've got all of these people gathered around and they're seeing this smaller group of people, the apostles, speaking to them in their native languages. And so what we talked about last week is like some people probably recognize this as, wow, God's really doing something. But to be honest, probably most of them were looking at this as, yeah, these people are drunk, right? Like, like they've been hitting the sauce too early. And so, and, and so Peter takes the opportunity to stand up, to speak, to address them. And he starts out right out of the gate dealing with the elephant in the room, which is the reality that at nine o'clock in the morning, the apostles of Jesus are not hitting the sauce yet, right? Okay. That's not what is happening here. He's saying, we are not drunk. He's like, but what is happening here? I want to tell you about. And he goes on to tell them about what is, is going on. He heads into this message. And, and, and so, one intentional thing that, G, that Peter does here, understand, is, is he dips back into the Old Testament and he uses Old Testament scripture that all of these people would have known already in order to impact their lives. And so, throughout this message, we see 
uh, we see references, direct references to Joel chapter 2, to Psalms chapter 110, to Psalms chapter 132, and then we see allusions to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 as well as 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, Peter kind of uses all of that in the span of about 30 verses or so, as well as kind of gives his own you know, original content. And so, ultimately what we see G, uh, Peter doing here is he's utilizing known Old Testament passages. These are known Old Testament passages. These are not new passages to this group of people. They would have known these things. They would have heard these things before. They would have studied these things growing up. Like, this is all very, uh, very normal to them. But what Peter does is he takes what's normal what's regular, what's known to them, and connects it to the person of Jesus Christ. So here's what happens. Peter, after he, after he deals with the drunkenness issue, he dives into the, into the book of Joel. This is what happens. Let's read verse 17 through 21 here. It says this, and it will be in the last days. This is a quote from Joel chapter, uh, Joel chapter 2. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity, And then your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days and they will prophesy. And I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, uh, blood and fire and uh, cloud of smoke. And the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. And then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So let's, let's look at a few notes here from Joel. Joel says, again, Old Testament, this is a direct quote from Joel chapter 2. In the last days, okay, that's important, right? A, a lot of the Old Testament prophets, as you read through the Old Testament books, like they, they regularly say in the last days. That's a common phrase, okay? And, and so the prophets of the Old Testament use this phrase to talk about the coming age of the Lord, the future coming of, of the Messiah, of, of Jesus coming to earth. Like that's what they were talking about. And they were looking forward to Jesus coming and being on earth in the last days. And so that's what they're referring to. And so in part, anyway, these people that are hearing this from Peter in Acts chapter 2, early in the first century, right, were, were living out the in the last days season. Like, like that's what the prophets were, were talking about because, and again, the, the next verse goes on to support that even more because, again, the prophet Joel said, when God pours out his spirit, sound familiar? It should. We talked about it last week. Like, just go back and read the first part of, of Acts chapter 2 where, where God pours out his spirit on, on the disciples, Right? on those who are gathered, on his followers, right? So it, it sounds awful familiar to what happened earlier in that day. And then if we jump down to, to verse 19, 19 is interesting because it talks about signs and wonders and it talks about a, a, a blood and fire and smoke. And, and I don't know if you're like me, like whenever I read stuff like this, my tendency is to begin to think end times, right? Revelation, like, things we've never seen before, like turning the world upside down. But, but I think if we jump down to verse 22, ultimately I think Peter's goal was, connect, was to connect those things to Jesus. This is what he says, verse 22, men of Israel, and this is Peter talking, right? Men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus the Nazarene was a man pointed out to you by God with what? With miracles and wonders and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves No. I mean, he's making a connection. What they knew from the book of Joel, from the prophecy of Joel, Peter's trying to say, Jesus was that prophecy. Jesus was that man who lived all of this out. Now, understand, like, it's not to say that we we are incorrect in connecting these things to Revelation, okay? Uh, That's not necessarily incorrect, but as we dive into, like, as you look at verse 21 and 22... Leading up to just this verse, right, the language kind of seems to lend itself a little bit more towards end times and the second return of, of Jesus, right? But, but here's the thing, like, I, I don't want us to get so focused on end times conversation that we miss what Jesus is doing right in front of us. And I have to believe that Peter was doing this at least in part as well. Yes, I think some of these, this does, in fact, point towards Revelation, 
And many commentators will agree with that as well. But I think what Peter is doing here in verse 22, he's saying, hold on, slow down. Don't miss the fact that Jesus lived these things out right in front of your eyes. And I think what Peter is saying without directly saying it is, y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Jesus was right here in front of you and you missed it. You missed seeing him. And so this is why I believe Peter took, took a pause from Joel here and he shared what he did about in, in, in verse 22. Peter's like, you've seen the man who's been talked about here, the, the prophecy, the Messiah that's coming. You saw him. Like maybe you even interacted with him. Some of these people had to have been around about 40 days before when Jesus was hung on a cross. Some of these people probably were in the crowd of people chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Some of these people maybe even, even uh, passed by or possibly interacted with Jesus after he resurrected from the dead three days later. And, and Peter's pointing to the fact that, okay, you've heard this. It's been prophesied. Now don't miss Jesus here. Don't miss who he is. Don't miss what he's doing. And then we look at, if we continue on, verse 23 and 24. Peter just continues to drive the nail in here, right? He's trying to drive home this point, this man that you saw, this man that you witnessed, this man that, that you heard things about. He gets really pointed here and he said, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. He's putting the ownership on them. Did they actually do it? No. But they used lawless people in order to kill him. And keep a watch out, like this is not the only time that Peter gets really direct with this group of people about this subject of, of, of this crowd putting Jesus on the cross. But Peter continues on. That didn't stop Jesus, right? That didn't stop him. He, like he's not still in the grave. Jesus, Peter continues, death could not hold Jesus down. And then as we continue on, verse 25 through about verse 28 or so, Peter is referencing now Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16 was written by King David of the Old Testament, right? King David, like David and Goliath, um, military leader, king of Israel, right? So that's the King David. And, and, and David wrote that psalm, and it talks about how, how God is going to raise someone from the dead. And some would make the argument, well, David's writing about himself, like he's prophesying about how God's going to raise him from the dead as well. But Peter's bringing to light the fact that David is in, sta in fact still dead, right? Like his tomb is still there in the first century. You could go visit it, like it was still closed up. His body was still in there. We know for certain David was not raised from the dead. And so what Peter's doing here, again, is he's connecting it to Jesus, He's saying, you've heard this prophecy. You've heard David talk about this, oh, how, how God's going to raise someone from the dead. Peter's saying, that happened in the man Jesus that we're talking about here. Jesus is that man. And it, it explained more, it's explained more in, in verses 29 through 31. He just goes on again to reinforce, David is dead. David was not raised. Like this, th this was not talking about David. Like his tomb, his tomb is still there. And it's occupied, Peter says. But, but David prophesied about the one who was going to come in the future and God was going to raise him. Well, we know who that is, right? It's Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. And then we continue on, verse 32. Peter goes on to prove it. And he says, listen, we know this for certain about Jesus because people saw it, right? We are all witnesses of it. And in fact, some of the people in the crowd may have been witnesses of it. Like, like, we have seen this. We are witnesses of it. And then verses 30, 33 through 35, Peter again talks about what's happening next. And he references now Psalms chapter 110. Again, it's a psalm of David. And he talks about, this psalm talks about how, how God is going to exalt somebody and sit them at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Well, again, we can look back on this and know what that's talking about. That's not David talking about what's coming in the future for him, Right? That's David prophesying about Jesus. And this just happened, possibly days before this, right? Jesus was with them on earth. He went back up into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God until, until he returns to this earth to claim all those who are his, right? Like this is what happened to Jesus. And then he tops it off with this, verse 36. So important. 
Peter ends it this way, and he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, here it is again, whom you crucified, right? Whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Be sure you know, Peter says, that this is Jesus. This man that you tried to kill on the cross is, is the prophesied Messiah that was talked about throughout the Old Testament, throughout the whole New Testament, Old Testament. And I think if we stop here for a second, we just pause here, I, th- I think we see something uh, remarkable and really practical for us that Peter is doing here. I, I, like, I think he's showing us something here, again, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, like he's listening to the Holy Spirit and, and, and listening to what God is telling him to do. But I, I think we see Peter do something pretty amazing in this message. And I don't want us to miss, miss this. Like, I, I think at times in our lives, we struggle with how to talk with people about who Jesus is. Yeah? I, I think we can go through all of our lives and maybe not ever have a meaningful conversation with anybody about Jesus because we can really struggle with it. Like maybe opportunities we know of, we can think of, present themselves, and we don't know how to react. We don't know how to respond. We don't know how to interact with people around us. And so I think what Peter is doing here is he's doing a couple intentional things that we can learn from. And so we're going to get really practical here this morning. So the first thing is this, before Peter says anything at all, before a word comes out of his mouth, there's something that gets people's attention. And Peter watches for the opportunity to share. Peter watches for the opportunity to share here. He doesn't just walk out and try to get people's attention. No, he had their attention, right? What happened right before this? Holy Spirit came on. Everybody thought they were drunk, right? He's got their attention. He's watching for it, and he has their attention. But then he quickly moves on to the second thing. Peter, Peter starts sharing with them, and he connects Jesus to something real in their lives. Peter intentionally connects Jesus to something that was well known in in their life. Joel's messages, Joel's prophecy would have been well known to these people. David's psalms would have been well known to these people. They would have studied it from birth. They would have known it. They may have even been able to quote it. Like, like they knew it. And so hearing these things would have grabbed their attention. And immediately, Peter starts off quoting Joel chapter 2, right? But, but he doesn't just use them for the sake of the prophecy and just, just go on from there. Peter intentionally connects Jesus to the prophecy, right? Like he makes a connection from something that was real in their world from the time that they were born to the person of Jesus and who he is, And so we see this through the use of Joel, right? They talk about the miracles done by this Messiah coming. Well, Peter connects it to Jesus. And then they jump up to Psalms chapter 16 and talking about how God's going to raise somebody from the dead, right? And what does Peter do? He connects it to Jesus, right? And then he goes on to Psalms chapter 110 and it talks about how God's going to ascend and raise somebody up to sit next to him in heaven. And what does does Peter do? He connects him to Jesus, right? Right? He connects it to Jesus. He takes real things in their lives and connects it to Jesus. He makes these connections to something that is real and relevant in their world, to who Jesus is and what he is doing around them. And for some of them, right directly next to them. And so he brings this this crowd in. He draws them in. He watches for the opportunity, right? He, he, He looks for something real in their world. He connects it to, excuse me, to Jesus. He kind of draws them in. And then Peter does an intentionally third thing here. Peter gives a clear path for a response. Peter gives a clear path for a response. This is what verse 37 says. Verse 37 says that they had deep conviction, that they were pierced to the heart. They said, "We we we are struck by this. And then they asked Peter, what do we do then? What do we do then? What shall we do? Because we're pierced to the heart. And this is what happens. Verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children 
and all who are far off, as many as the Lord or God will call. He gives a clear path. They ask, what are we supposed to do? Peter says, do this. This is what you do. I think, I think one of the most important things that the church is called to do is to continue to push forward the message of salvation for all people. I, I think one of the, the most important things that the church has to continue to do is continually push forward the message that Jesus came to bring salvation for all people. Like that has to continue going forward. Like we, we can say it a million times, right? That we need to be about connecting people to Jesus and each other. We can say it over and over and over uh, a million times. But the reality is, is if we don't do that, if we don't live this out, we're not doing what we're called to do. And, and it's not just as a church, okay? It is as a church, but it's also, and frankly, more importantly for us as individuals. Like if you're a, a disciple of Jesus and you are not about making Jesus famous, if you're not about sharing his message then you're not doing what you're supposed to be, what you're called to be about as a follower of Jesus. This is the focus that we see in the early church, right? As we continue on through the book of Acts, we are going to continually see this over and over, how they had this, this drive and this ambition to share the gospel uh, of Jesus. Now, did they execute it perfectly? No, absolutely not. And we may see that from time to time. Are we going to execute it perfectly? No, of course not. We can see that regularly, right? Like, like we don't do things perfectly, but the vision is still there. And the, and the vision still remained for the early church, and the vision must still remain for us now. And so Peter equipped with the Holy Spirit, which is what we talked about last week, right? This is where he gets his power. This is where he gets his influ influence. This is where he gets the transformative power that, that we see working in this moment. It only comes from the Holy Spirit. And what does Peter do? First, he takes the opportunity to speak to this group because he had their attention, because the opportunity presented itself, right? Like, like he saw that, that, that they are looking at us now, and so he steps up and he says, I'm gonna take this opportunity and I'm gonna connect Jesus to something that's relative or rel relevant in their, in their world, and, and then Peter recognizes the opportunity that he has to show them what the next steps are. Let's make it practical for us, a few things we can do. First one is this. We need to look for opportunities to share with others. We need to look for opportunities to share Jesus with others. We need to be watching for opportunities to share with others. I mean, think about it. Just in, in your life, in your world, in the interactions that you've had, how many times have we missed the opportunities to share Jesus with people because we weren't looking for them, because we were distracted, because we ignored them and turned the other way? How many missed opportunities have we had? How many times have we been presented with the perfect chance, the perfect opportunity to engage with somebody in conversation, and by intention or not, we choose to ignore, we choose to pass it up, or we miss it because we're just not looking for it? How many times has that happened? For years, I carried around guilt for this very reason. I had a friend in high school, this was 15 years ago probably, that um, we were on a trip for FFA. We were sitting in a hotel room, and he pulls out the Gideon's Bible, and not jokingly, not sarcastically, not making a mockery out of anything, he opens up to a verse, and he says, Matt, I want to know what this means. And I intentionally, I didn't miss the opportunity because I wasn't watching for it. I intentionally changed the subject. I intentionally chose to talk about something else. And we didn't have that conversation then. And in fact, that conversation didn't come up again. And a few years later, he was killed in a car accident. And I carried around that guilt for years. I carried around that guilt for years uh, because I really felt like that was on, on me. That opportunity was taken away from me. 
we, ha- we have to be ready for these things. We have to be watching. We have to be listening uh, for the opportunities that those around us given, ev- give us, even just the littlest thing. We have to be ready to jump on those opportunities and engage in conversations with people because sometimes those opportunities are taken away from us and there are no other opportunities given, right? Sometimes that's it. And so Peter first had the wisdom to look for the opportunity and then secondly, Peter used something very, very real from the crowd's world, from the crowd's life in order to start a conversation, right? Like he took Joel He took Psalms, and he made a connection to who Jesus is. They knew these scriptures, right? And he connected it to the life of Jesus and who he is, and it impacted them on very real ways. And we need to look for these opportunities, right? We need to look for the ways that we can connect Jesus to others' real lives in real ways, like here's, here's what we tend to do, I think. I, tend, I think a lot of times we, we, we see the opportunity and maybe we get really excited, right? And we go, you need Jesus. You just like hammer that in. Like, and what are we saying to them though? Like in reality, we, we need to figure out how to connect Jesus to their real lives because they don't know what they don't know, do they? People don't know that they, don't need, that they need Jesus, right? They don't know that, that they need a savior, right? Like, like we have to sometimes do the work for that. But what a great opportunity we have to share from our own lives maybe, to make the connection, to share our own struggles from our own lives with people, our own shortcomings, our own pain, our own losses, our own disappointments. And and here's how it can maybe go. Like like a lot of times, I don't know if this is you or not, like you're just sitting there and you're having a conversation with a coworker, a friend, a family, whoever it is, right? And you're just having a casual conversation with somebody and they begin to kind of talk about what's going on in their lives, and they start sharing with you maybe the struggle that they're in or the pain that they're going through, the loss that they have, or the, you know, they're on the brink of a divorce or whatever the situation is, right? Like they just start kind of sharing this to you. If you're watching, you have the opportunity, right? They're giving you the opportunity. What are you going to do with it? How do you connect Jesus to their real life? Well, we get the opportunity to say, I understand, right? I understand. I've been there. I've been on the brink of divorce before. I've been in financial ruin before. I've had kids run away before. I, I've lost my job before. I've, I've, I've lost a loved one before. I've been extremely sick. You know, whatever it is, we get the opportunity to go, hey, I can relate to you in this way, but we can't forget that we also get to pivot to Jesus, right? And go, because of Jesus, he brought me through this. He delivered me through this, Right? Like, it's not me getting through this on my own. I, the testimony we give is not us saying, hey, look at me and everything I did by myself. It's us pivoting to Jesus and go, hey, I relate to you. Here's how I got through it. His name's Jesus, and we all need him, right? God has worked through me. Jesus has worked through. Jesus has showed us a way out. Jesus has healed us. Jesus has helped us find freedom, whatever it is. And suddenly, you've created a connection between you and them, yes, but more importantly, Jesus in them and their real lives. And if we just remain faithful and we continue to do our part and we continue to have the conversations when they present themselves, we, we are faithful in our part and God's faithful in his part, maybe down the line we get the opportunity to witness something even more amazing, which is what Peter got to witness, which is our third point here which is we need to give a clear path for others' response. When the time is right, when they're ready, when they, when they say, what do we do? When they're broken, when they realize that they need something more in their lives, we pray sometime along the way, like these conversations lead to a heart that is pricked to where they go, I need something else in my life. I need a savior in my life. What do I do? What do I do? And we get to share with them the path. We get to share with them the response that is clear and it's simple and it's easy. This is what Paul says, right? Paul says in Ephesians that we are saved by the grace of God because of faith. He says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. I I think so many times we look at faith as like this, this noun, right? 
I think so oftentimes we look at faith as, as a noun where it's something that we have, where it's something that we can like hold on to, where it's like a, a puppy that we can like hold in our hands, right? And it's a thing that we have. But I think what Paul's doing in Ephesians 2 is two, Ephesians 2, is he's saying, you know, it's, it's by grace you've been saved, not because of a, a tangible noun type faith. It's because of an action-oriented verb faith. Because of your faith, through your faith. Faith is not something you hold, it's something that you do, it's something that you li- live out. And so it's the realization, right? that we have been saved by the grace of God and we get to respond to that by doing a few things, right? Like we respond by, by confessing Jesus, by saying, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. I wanna live my life for you. And so we respond by confessing. We respond by repenting from sin. This is always a fun run, right? Like, like we, get, we get to daily make the decision. I'm going to continually turn away from sin in my life. I'm going to continually start living more and more the way that Jesus desires for me to live because of the leading of the Holy Spirit and because of what he says in his word, right? And so we respond by confessing. confessing. We respond by repenting from sin. We, we respond by, by being baptized into the life or into the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and being brought up then to live a, a new life that is surrendered to Jesus. And we respond every day by living that surrendered life, saying, Jesus, you're Lord of my life, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow you. And I'm gonna make you Lord of my life today, and I'm gonna do it again tomorrow. We get to respond. This is the message that Peter delivered. This is the message that started the church some 2,000 years ago, and it's the message that then led into verse 32, where it says that 3,000 people were added to their numbers that day. Man, this is the message that they needed to hear 2,000 years ago, and this is the message that the world today needs to hear as well. So some of us need to step out, and we need to to speak that message. We need to give that message. We need to put this into action. We need to confidently look for those opportunities to have these conversations, right? Right? We need to keep our eyes open looking for the opportunities that people give us where we can speak truth into their lives. And then when the opportunity arises, what do we do? We connect their lives with Jesus, right? We connect in real ways their lives to Jesus. And then when the time's right, maybe we even get the opportunity to go, and this is how you respond. And this is what you do. This is the clear path that you need to take in order to make Jesus Lord of your life. Like these are the things we get to do. This is what we're called to do. When Matthew 28 says, go and make disciples, that's what this is talking about, right? When, when, when Jesus calls us to, to be disciples by, by following him and being changed by him and getting on his mission, that's what this is talking about, right? Like this is what that's talking about. This is what the world needs. The world needs more of this Jesus, church. And so some of us need to put this into action. And then there's some of us that maybe just need to step back and realize that we have never followed the clear path to begin with. Some of us may be here and we're living in this place to where we realize we're missing Jesus altogether. We're, we're, we have not given our lives to him. We have not surrendered to him. We have not lived any of this out at all. We've never made that decision in our lives. We're at a place to where we're trying to make it on our own. We're living in a place to where we're trying to make something more of our lives on our own. But man, we pray that at some point we get to a place to where that's not enough. And our soul, our heart is pricked. And we begin to think, I need something more. I need a savior. And if that's you, We want to walk through this with you. We want to lock arms with you and go, we want to answer the questions that you have. We want to to work through the struggles that you have and the uncertainty that you may have. We want to study. We want to pray. Like we want to do everything we can to walk through this process with you. And we want to celebrate that with you as well. And so if if that's you this morning, as we continue to worship this morning, as we continue to, uh, to do what we're doing and after service as well, Man, don't leave this place without making that decision, without talking to somebody. Myself, Dennis, there's others here as well. We want to talk with you about this. We want to study with you. We want to 
We want to work through this with you as well. I'm going to pray and we're going to continue uh, to worship and take communion together, but do not leave this place without making that decision and putting something into action this morning. Heavenly Father, God, I'm thankful again just for your word. I'm thankful for this message from Peter that, that challenges us, that can convict us. God, I pray above everything else that it would, that would, it would embolden us to step out, to actively look for the opportunities that are right before us to engage in conversations with others. God, I pray that you would give us the words to say in order to connect Jesus to, to people in, in their real lives, God. And, and when the time presents itself, help us to walk people through the clear path in response that leads directly to you. God, this is about you. This is about Jesus. Help us simply to be an instrument in that process. We thank you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For communion today.